Welcome, John. Great to see you. Thank you. John, um, you were the deputy group chairman and chairman of HSBC PLC, and now the chairman of GSK. That's quite a unique perch to see the flow of events. You've been in one of the largest institutions in the world and one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Um, you're also at Goldman Sachs and KPMG before that in very senior roles too. Now this is it's quite a unique position from which we can have this dialogue. And I would very much like to explore with you the insights that come from this experience of yours. Um, our context for the discussion is that the SDG funding gap, we estimate in our latest research to be $100 trillion to 2030. That seems to, to many as if it's an insurmountable challenge. But I think the pandemic, and we refer to it in our report as a red line between a carbon past and a cleaner, more sustainable future. You've been at the helm of a very important organization during that pandemic, and you've seen the global damage that's wrought to lives and economies, um, hurting the most vulnerable, which calls for a need for us to apply capital, innovation, imaginatively and boldly, taking risk for reward and impact. And I'd like to dig into that with you to see what insights come out of that. But let me step back first and ask you the first question, which is what are the major issues facing the world from your perspective as it comes out of the pandemic into this UN's decade of action? Thank you. Um, that's a big question. And actually, um, you know, I think for the first time in the last 18 months, I've actually seen my uh, experiences in financial services and healthcare overlap. I mean, they had been somewhat of parallel universes, but um, they are now they are now inextric inextricably joined in a number of number of ways. And I very much like the way you characterize this as a red line. And I really think if there's one one real message to people that we should think of the world pre-COVID and the world post-COVID, because I think there are many different things. I think in economics and in finance, you know, we're used to uh, the world is segmented. There are economic barriers through trade. There are economic barriers with currency. You know, the, the, the developed economic markets are really not connected to the developing part of the world. Access to finance, access to banking uh, in different parts of the world is really heavily restricted. I think what is clear with infectious disease, there are no barriers. It is simply goes from a local to a global, a global issue in you know in a very in a very short space of time, and therefore I think um, we now see intertwined, you know, the economic and the human cost of the pandemic, and it is enormous. You know, if you think about the firepower that the the world used in two thousand and eight to save the banking system, you know, the firepower now that has been used you know, to, to, to prevent the, the full economic and human cost of this is, you know, is way more. What is absolutely clear is that there is no more capacity. We don't have the same financial capacity available. The UK doesn't have another 400 billion pounds that it can do to the next pandemic. The one thing that is absolutely crystal clear is there will be another one. You know, and I think that this one, I mean, I hesitate to say, use the word we were fortunate, but actually, you know, through Ebola, you know, the, 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 the COVID virus was very well characterized. You could move very quickly from an identification of the protein to an identification of the MRA. We could move quickly. But I think we have actually now got to realize that in the same way as the world woke up to the fragility of the financial system we've actually now got to recognize the fragility of the health system and it has no barriers john you you know that the um, the global financial crisis was such a shock and you know, the lessons were learned and during this um, crisis the financial system reacted better what are those lessons yeah. as you see it because from, from your perspective at HSBC, you saw what changed. What, what do you yeah. think we demonstrated this time? Well, I think actually what, um, 
what we saw this time was actually the cumulative lesson. You know, if you think about the financial system, it has been building robustness in it since Bretton Woods in 1944 when we came off, we came off the gold standard. You know, there has been increasing harmony across the institutions. We formed the World Bank, we formed the IMF, uh, the, um, the regulators and the central bankers communicate with one another. And what we saw in 2008 was a significant elevation of that cooperation because, you know, we all know we saw the abyss uh, in, in, in 2008 with Lehman Brothers. And I think that the, the, the financial community did come together in a very constructive way. You know, the capital requirements of of the banking system rose dramatically. I mean, I think the capital requirements of the capital requirements of have doubled. The resiliency of the system technologically, um, and 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 so on. And so, the banking system now is dramatically safer than it was today. That it is today than it was before. But it is, I think, the cumulative effect of. Um, you know, the, the system since 1944. I mean, if if COVID is health, Bretton Woods, we don't have 50 years to adapt to, you know, a way in which we can seamlessly and, 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 and rapidly react to these situations and provide the protection that the world needs. So I think that this is a massive moment in time for the world to really think through you know, what do global institutions need to look like for health? I mean, it... John, do you see us forming the equivalent of Bretton's Wood for healthcare now? That we've, we've, we've lost more than four and a half million people in a very short space of time from an invisible enemy. Is it time to now treat this as the aftermath, and we haven't finished yet, but you know, the near aftermath perhaps of a war and establish those kinds of institutions going forward. Is, is, is that your view? Yes, I think so. I think, look, I think the, uh, I think the institutions exist. I mean, the WHO and Gavi, for example, are, you know, potentially remarkable organisations to resolve, resolve some of these issues. Sadly, they have been politicised uh, through this phase. And, you know, the politicisation of, health in other places too. You know, it is not acceptable, you know, for the developed world to be talking about booster vaccine number one, booster vaccine number two, booster vaccine number three, when the world has not, had, most of the world has not had a single, a single protective, protective shock. So I do think that, um, you know, rather than create something new, I think that there does need to be a new mandate to uh, the WHO, you know, there has to be in the next pandemic, there has to be rapid globalization of technology and rapid manufacturing of, of it, of tech transfer and manufacturing to ensure that the world gets equal access because we are still very, very vulnerable. John, how, have, how has this pandemic changed the process and possibilities for innovation um, for pharmaceutical companies. What, what, what have you seen change that seem like it might take much longer, but this pandemic has spurred something? Um, what is that change? Well, I, you, 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 you're right. I mean, if, um, you know, we were talking about this in an abstract way before, I think we would have all said, you know, vaccine, the vaccine cycle is eight years and, you know, that's what it's going to, going to take. We saw it in a year. Um, and I think that the lessons are, I mean, there's two, 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 big, two big lessons. Number one, collaboration. Um, I've seen in the last year industry collaboration that I've never, ever witnessed before. I mean, as you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry is one of the most intensely competitive industries on the planet you know, collaborations, partnerships were formed, you know, between big companies, embryonic companies, big companies with big companies, big companies with academia, you know, in a way that came to, 
uh, resolve a mission. So I think um, the collaboration between government, academia and industry, um, I really, really hope that we don't lose that. And uh, as I think you know, that um, I've recently been participating in the, in the development of the UK life science strategy. And one of the things that we're really trying to retain in that is the mission driven collaboration because you know this discussion also applies to obesity mental health aging cancer and so on the second the second really big lesson has been the rapid acceleration of technology again i think you know there were lots of things coming together mrna wasn't a you know been in the works for 10 years it rapidly mature the genetics and the ability to sequence genomes on large scales identify and measure you know small changes in the in the, in the genome of the pathogens i mean it has been remarkable so there's a lot that's come together biology data sciences mathematics that all come together in a very collaborative way but it has been an ex extraordinary acceleration of, uh, of of technology and I think you know we all of the all of the world's issues are going to be solved by you, you know the application of innovation and if there's another message in all of this is that um, that we've got to foster innovation you know right across the world sadly it sounds like it took something as horrible as the pandemic and the continuous infection and death count and overburdening of the system to force that innovation. But now that it's happened, do you feel that we could apply that to everything else in the world? That, you know, every, this won't be the first issue, it won't be the first, pan, next pan, you know, first pandemic, we'll get many, but there'll be many issues. Do you feel there is a way for us to transfer those lessons and, and show that we're a learning world and we can, we can do better next time? Well, I, look, I, I, I do think if we've created a new muscle for the world, um, you know, it's one that needs strengthening. I mean, I think it's weak. Um, and you can, you can already see a little bit of a sigh of relief coming from, you know, the vaccinated populations that, you know, you can relax your guard, you can go back to things as they as they were governments move back to national agendas we industry moves back so i do think that um you know there does need to be a permanent convening authority here yes. you know because otherwise we will lapse back into you know complacency and we won't be prepared for the next one and so i do think that um you know we need to we as i say we need this convening discipline that says you know let's work on the next one now and we should work on the next one now yes. i mean as, as you know through our you know mutual relationship with 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 sally davis and the work that she has been doing on antimicrobial resistance there's still plenty of risk out there mm -hmm. John, you, you spoke about the fact that the world is still divided between those that have had the vaccine in the richer countries and those that haven't. It sounds like, from what you say, am I right in thinking that we're, we're therefore still not resilient? We still haven't learned to share enough? No, no, we're, we're, we're not. But I, do, but I do think the body is willing. Um, you know, I, I, I do think we, re we reckon, I mean, at GSK, we recognize this, you know, our partnership with um, Gavi is central to you know, how we think about uh, global health. Moderna have just announced that they're going to build a plant in, in Africa. The Serum Institute in, in, in India has got the scale um, that there can be rec rapid tech transfer. What I think we've got to have is um, a network of, of manufacturing capacity around the world so that, so that when the scientists do determine that there is a you know, there is a route to a, 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 a successful vaccine. It's got to be globalized immediately. And so I do think that this, 
network of capacity manufacturing capacity around the world you know that does need to be put in place john i i'd like you to go back and put your finance hat on for me now um what can the finance industry learn from the pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare industry's experience over the last 18 months as the finance industry uh, as possessing so much or managing controlling or stewarding so much of the world's money as it thinks about applying that to the issues of the world what can it learn yeah it's really it's it's a it's a very interesting question and you know i'm you know humble enough to know that i don't know the answer to that none of us to do that com to com completely but i but i do think that um you know if 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 the world is going to um, remove the inequalities um, that we would all really wish that the world was much more equal. Then I think equality of health and equality of wealth are going to be the two driving forces for it. Um, I think if if this has told us beyond any question of doubt that health is a global issue and it actually has to be tackled as such. Well, look at, you know, look at financial institutions. You know, I know from HSBC that the anti-money laundering, you know, the compliance requirements, you know, there are large parts of the world, which even if, even if large banking institutions wanted to go into Africa and make financial services available, bring wealth creating, products to them. They can't. So I do think that, you know, the financial institutions, while there's a lot going on in terms of, you know, ESG responsibility, investing and financing um, mm -hmm. alternative ever, uh, energy sources, for the vast, large parts of the world, it is inaccessible, you know, to develop market banking systems. But well, why is that, John? Go a little bit deeper into that, because the, the you have an enormous audience of people who are in those countries and want this finance to flow to them. What, what is stopping that finance flow? Well, I think I think it is, um, you know, un understandably, the um, know your customer regime, you, you know, the responsibility that the, you know, the, 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 the the, the banking system is not only a utility to move money, it's a sort of a protection against financial crime as well. It is a first line, first line leadership in financial crime. But the consequences of the, I, I, I guess, the barriers against, you know, doing business with people that you can't um, validate and it's not just validating that customer it's validating that customer's customers and the businesses that they do you know does mean that for compliance reasons you know these markets are inaccessible because you know no bank is going to want to take on that uncalibrated risk yeah. threaten threaten financial crime into the system and you know run the risk of huge fines and compliance risks so you know, that model is understandable and it's necessarily tight. Yes. But it leads large tracts of the world that are, you know, Africa and Latin America in particular that, you know, have are inaccessible. And so if we see, you know, if we see finance as a, you know, force for good to, mm -hmm. you, you know, improve living standards around the world, you know, we've got to think about, you know, how do we make it more globally accessible? Interesting. I, I, I see the positive part of what you're saying. You're saying there is a system which makes finance resilient and, and enables it to flow. And actually, during the, this last crisis, it's, it's been stable. For that to happen in all parts of the world, you'd need to raise the standards of all parts of the world yes. so that the finance yes. can flow. And if it can't, then it isn't accessible. So that there is a yes. barrier to raising standards, which if we haven't raised yeah. them everywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. I understand. John, what does it take to make a step chain in addressing the SDGs? You know, these SDGs you know, are wide in scope, affecting people, prosperity, the planet, 
the physical and virtual infrastructure, you know, peace and partnering, uh, five very big categories. If we're, if, we're to, if we're to address all of them, um, from your perspective uh, and combining your, your, all your previous experience, we'd like you to bring it in these last few minutes to a point where you give us an insight into how do we think about that? What does it take to get them really funded? Well, I think, um, you know, to, to keep learning the lessons. I mean, I really do think, I mean, I, I do worry that there is, you know, you can feel a little bit of relaxation going on, you know, especially in Europe and you see it in the US and others that, you know, it's sorted. We can go back to mm -hmm. back to life as it as it was. And I think that we have to keep pushing hard the view that the world is not safe until the world is safe. And um, we are, you know, we are still very vulnerable. I do think that there is, um, you know, there's some recognition of this, you know, in the, you know, and this isn't the way to do it, but the, the surp surplus capacity can now be applied to other parts of the world. But I do think that, you know, that what we saw in 2008 and what we saw in 2020 with COVID are lessons that more cohesion, more collaboration, you know, embracing the world, you know, is, is the most important thing we can all do. And I and I and I just think that this message just needs to keep coming through because once you once you get that point, yes. you know, the SDGs becomes, you know, it's it's you, you know, you're in the they're in the flow there. You know, and it's not pushing, mm -hmm. pushing hard against it. But I do think that we have now got two really very real situations where the world together is much stronger than the world apart. And, and if you believe that, then you absolutely believe in equality and the SDGs. John, that's, that's an interesting note to end on, because I think what you're calling for is for us to have uh, a, a view that everyone in the world is, is part of we, it's not them, so that we reach across and we find the solutions yeah. to whether it's access to capital or medicine or something else, but we find that. that that's a very positive note. Let me, any final comments as we wrap up? No, I mean, I, look, I think there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to explore here, but, um, you know, as you just said, look, let's... Um, you, you know, let's look at the positives and the and the and the real lessons and learnings that have come out to this. Because um, you know, we've got to show that we, as a as a planet, you, you know, are economically safe, safe from a health perspective, and ultimately also, you, you know, safe from a climate perspective. These are the three the three driving forces. Very good. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.